Hey everybody, thanks for joining us again today uh, here with another great episode of uh, Pacific Research Institute's Young Leaders Circle uh, speaker series. And aside from that incredibly long title, um, it's a really interactive, fun series where we're talking to um, more young professional focused people in think tanks, uh, government, public policy. So today we're um, really, really excited. We have a great panelist who's um, on the West Coast with us at a think tank, Anna Miller. She works for the Idaho Freedom Foundation. Anna, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. So let's, uh, let's dive right in. Um, you do education work at uh, Idaho Freedom Foundation. You know, I think a lot of states may see parallels in what's going on with their schools, but can you take us through um, what are some of the issues that families and students are facing right now uh, due to COVID and, and maybe the status of, of school shutdowns? Yeah, so COVID-19 has really brought to the forefront a lot of the problems that already existed in the education system, but um, that people weren't necessarily acting on. Um, so it's really just exasperated certain problems. So for example, virtual learning has shown how, um, how much public schools struggle to adapt and to be flexible. Um, and just the reopening issue has highlighted the power imbalance between teachers unions and, and uh, school boards and how teachers unions are able to literally hold students hostage over policy disagreements. Um, and so it's highlighted a lot of things. And because of that, we're seeing a mass exodus from the public school system right now. Like just for example, in Idaho, like 11,000, over 11,000 students have left the public school system to go to whether wow. it's learning pods or um, to go to a virtual charter school, which is obviously a public school, but a different type of public school sure. uh, or private schools, whatever it is. And while all the public schools in almost every single state have uh, remained closed most of the time, um, closed as in only providing virtual learning, um, private schools have largely opened. Um, and they've been able to set up certain routines and practices and things to keep students safe and to satisfy parents um, and adapt much more quickly than the public school has. And that really just highlights how bureaucratic um, the public school system is and how difficult it is for them to make decisions. You have so many different levels of decision-making in the public school system. The only thing that's really slightly close to that level of bureaucracy in the private system would be a Catholic school, still really sure. not very close at all. Um, I mean, it's really not very fair comparison, but that's the closest thing you have. Um, and so just because of that, it's not any individual teacher's fault. It's not the particular administrator's fault. I believe that all of those people in the public school system really want the best Absolutely. for students. But there are so many levels of decision making that they do not have the rights to act in the best interest of their particular community, of their um, particular students. So because of that, it's just very difficult for the public school system to adapt, especially in light of crazy changing circumstances like COVID. Um, and so the biggest policy change that we really need is education freedom because COVID has really shown that some people are more risk averse. Some people want virtual learning, but they want a better virtual learning environment than the public school system is providing. Some students want to be in person. And so that's why private schools have been so quick to adapt because they have profit interests. And then some people want to do something like a pod or homeschool. Yep. So there's a lot of different ways that education funding could be used that it's not because it's all tied up in the public school monopoly. And you brought up an important point of, of teachers unions and um, I'll, I'll quickly speak to California obviously has uh, a large reputation of, of a very powerful teachers union in the CTA. Um, there is a, actually a bill here that Democrat lawmakers are introducing that says schools basically have to start uh, in March 2021. And it's based on the different um, coding system and ICU requirements here. But the, the teachers union here, they said in an article, they're fighting that bill basically to reopen. Are there similar actions in Idaho where the unions are pushing back and saying, we're just not reopening regardless of what teachers, parents, maybe administrators wanna do? Yes, absolutely. And there's been actions like that in nearly every single state. Actually, there's been a number of studies that have been done that have shown that where there are stronger teachers unions, schools are less likely to reopen. Got it. And the reason for that, it's not because teachers are evil. It's not because union members themselves are evil or anything like that. They're trying to ruin students' educations. It's because there's an uneven power dynamic where school boards are forced to negotiate with teachers unions, which is totally unprecedented in any other uh, form of contract law. You would have right. to voluntarily and mutually agree to negotiation in all of the terms. Otherwise, the contract would just be null and void. But teachers unions have been given special privileges by the legislature, and they know this. And so they're just acting rationally to the incentive structures that they've been given. And then also the, oh, sorry. Good. Sorry. the incentives sorry. of teachers unions though, 
the teachers union organizers, what they want to do is grow their union. That's their goal. Yep. But the goal of a school is to educate students. So those things are totally in conflict with each other. And so what is there anything lawmakers can do? Um, you know, we mentioned the bill in California, you know, other states. I think there is the dynamic playing out of you have private schools. I don't know if Idaho is like this, but California, um, private schools and charter schools have gotten waivers. Um, so, I mean, what can lawmakers do? Can they force schools to go back in? So I would definitely advocate against forcing schools, schools to reopen, especially public schools, because they're not prepared like private schools are because sure. um, the way control is centralized. Um, and I would be against, you know, of course, I would be against forcing teachers to work. They shouldn't be forced to work. But I think a better solution to really help families is to give families and students choice. So yep. if a student is fine with the public school being closed, if the family is fine with that, they can stay. If they're not, if they want to be in person, they should be able to take their education tax dollars everywhere. So really any form of education choice program, like an education savings account or um, some sort of tax, um, tax credit scholarship program, anything like that, that allows money to be centered on a student will disrupt the power balance in a public school system by allowing students that can't exit to exit, like low and middle income students who, where the public school has a monopoly on them. Um, a program like that will allow them to exercise choice and that will actually improve existing public schools because when a, a parent removes their child from a public school, it sends an extremely clear message. It's you are failing to provide the services that my student needs for these particular things. Yep. And that school then has that valuable information to say, okay, we need to act, we need to change this and they know what they need to do and they do that. Um, and that's been proven in a number of uh, different studies. Um, and so that's really the most powerful tool is just to let money follow the child and give power back to, to families to make education decisions for themselves. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, the school choice you're talking about, um, the old phrase budgets are about priorities. I mean, a lot of public schools, obviously, your uh, total enrollment of students determines your amount of money uh, in most states. So if, if students are leaving, going to private schools, going to charter schools, that does have a financial impact on school districts, on schools themselves. So it is a, it is a powerful tool if, if parents are allowed to do that. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, every single other education system, you know, the private education system is subject to profit and losses. Every single business yep. in the world is subject to profit and losses. And that is such an important mechanism. They all have fixed costs. Everyone always says the public school system has fixed costs. Well, of course they do. Every business does. They have to find ways to adapt and serve their customers' needs. And if they're not, then that's their own fault and they need to improve or get out of the business. Yes. I think there's there's a long, complicated rabbit hole of, of school funding <laughs> in any Very. state. So. Well, let, let's yeah. uh, shift from education. Um, I noticed you had worked previously on technology innovation and healthcare. Could you maybe talk about some of the work you did there and maybe any, um, if you're doing ongoing work or any ongoing issues, maybe you still keep an eye on? Sure, yeah. So um, two projects come to mind that I got to work on when I was working in technology and healthcare. Um, the first in healthcare is um, working on con laws. So okay. con laws are short for cert certificate of need laws. And when I was at Mercatus, uh, the Mercatus Center most recently, um, the state of Michigan was trying to um, use con laws to restrict cancer treatment for patients. So there was this new innovative cancer treatment that would have helped um, patients that had blood cancer. And they were tr the con board was trying to make it such that only one hospital in the state could offer this treatment. Um, which is obviously wrong. Everyone, no matter where you live in the state of Michigan in any state should have access to the latest treatments. Sure. Um, and so I was able to work on this project to um, get the, the legislature to um, block that, that restriction so everyone can receive cancer treatment. And that was exciting. And con laws, Mercatus Center has done so much research on this um, to show that it's just such a bureaucratic barrier to healthcare treatment. And it's, it's um, actually hurting healthcare outcomes. Um, wherever they are the strongest in whatever state, hurting people's healthcare outcomes. Um, and so that's just um, an exciting uh, thing I got to work on. And then in regards to technology, one thing I worked on, it's kind of an intersection of healthcare and technology actually was um, telehealth. So okay. when I was at the American Legislative Exchange Council, I got to produce a report um, on the biggest barriers to telehealth in every state and to write um, sort of an economic synopsis of how that was affecting the state, how it was affecting the doctor shortage in every state. Um, and so I, I created a publication where we rated every single state on a couple of main policy issues related to telehealth. And that's become really exciting during um, COVID. Yes. Because 
as you know, telehealth has been so important for getting people healthcare treatment without them being able to go in for in-person services. And a lot of states have begun removing a lot of the barriers that we identified in that report, things like um, you have to have an in-person meeting with a doctor first before receiving a telehealth treatment. That's obviously a barrier to, as you can see right now, we're having a normal conversation. If you were a doctor, you know, you could easily Absolutely. give me treatment if I have, I don't know, a rash or something like that, where I wouldn't be able to go into a doctor's office during COVID lockdowns. Um, so that's been exciting to see a lot of states remove restrictions. Like for example, I know Alabama really improved their laws for telehealth to create a lot more freedom. And so if we were to do that same ranking again, Alabama would get like an A in our ranking. And so that's, Got it. it was cool to see that impact. Yeah, I think if there was ever something that's evergreen or um, you need to put on your resume, it's the work on telehealth, especially in 2020. Um, I, I can't think, our, our president, um, Sally C. Pipes, is a healthcare fellow, um, a Thomas Smith healthcare fellow, but she was yelling about telehealth at the beginning um, and just what what uh, important piece of policy that's you know been adopted and used. Um, I we I have kids and we've done it um, for uh, appointments with our kids and it's a little weird at first because you're yeah. like putting it up to, but I, I mean it's it's so quick and it was the probably the, it'll be the easiest doctor appointment most people probably will ever do. Um, so it's you know, really using technology to, I think uh, you might know this better in Idaho, but, um, you know, rural healthcare always struggles and lags behind um, urban areas. So, I mean, I just, I think PRI and many other places hopes, you know, telehealth is here to stay and be stronger. Absolutely. I agree. Uh, it allows you access to the best doctors in the state or other states totally. and have them right in your home. So it's, yeah. it's pretty cool. Well, let's talk about, um, you know, how you ended up at Idaho Freedom Foundation. Could you maybe take us through, um, you know, where you went to school, what you studied, and then um, uh, how you ended up in the think tank world. Sure. So um, I went to school in South Carolina at a school called Furman University, which is a liberal okay. arts school. Um, and I studied philosophy, religion, and ancient Greek and Roman history there, which was extremely okay. fulfilling <laughs> to me and interesting. Uh, I have great parents who encouraged me to study something that I really loved and not to think so much just about a job or a career that I wanted to have, but sure. to think about you know, what am I passionate about? What is going to give me life? You know, and those were the things that I really cared about. And I had no idea what I wanted to do with a career, but um, I had a scholarship for athletics and I was under the impression that this is, this is my money. This is my uh, yeah. degree and I should use it for, you know, what's important to me. And so that's what I studied and I've never regretted it. Not once. Um, after college, I decided, you know, how am I going to use this? And I realized I want to do something that's going to be fulfilling to me and that's going to be a flexible um, career because I'm a big family person. I want to have a really big family someday. So I want um, flexibility in my schedule and things. So turns out think tanks are a really good fit for that. So after college, I moved to DC um, and got a job up there at the American Conservative Union. And then that led to various other positions. Um, and so I did that and it was, it's been a great career so far. I've enjoyed it. I've been able to apply um, all the different things I learned in college, philosophy and classics and religion for the conservative movement are so um, important just for understanding the constitution, for understanding um, economics, yeah. believe it or not. Um, it's a huge foundation for understanding government and um, systems of thought. And so uh, that was, you know, that's probably the best decision I ever made was my major. Um, and so anyways, then I got married this past summer um, to my husband and he wanted to, he's a football player and he wanted to transfer for okay. his graduate school somewhere and we came out to the west to visit a couple schools and we just fell in love with Boise State University and we fell in love with um, the, the town of, I of Boise and the, the state of Idaho it's beautiful here and we just we loved it and so we decided you know we're young we're in our early 20s we should take a risk you know we should sure. go live somewhere that uh, that's exciting to us and so we just moved out here and um, I left uh, you know, my job and I was able to continue graduate school remotely. And I just found a job here at the Idaho Freedom Foundation. You know, there's a think tank in every state. Uh, as people listening to this may or may not know, there's think tanks in every state. So if you want to work for one, you can really live wherever you want and still work yep. for a think tank, still be part of the public policy movement. Um, and I had been wanting to work in education policy actually for a while. That's the topic I'm the most passionate about. And they happen to have a job available here. And so really just worked out. It was a natural fit um, for me to come to Idaho Freedom. And what, um, what sport did you do at, at your college? What was the name of college again? Furman University. Furman University. What, what, was the, what did you get a scholarship in? Uh, so I played volleyball there. Okay. Great. Cool. Um, 
yeah, that was a great experience. I'm always going to be thankful for my head coach who believed in me at the time that she did. Um, it was a hard experience playing college sports, but I'll never regret it. I'll always be thankful that, uh, you know, it paid for the degree that I have today. Yep. So huge. Uh, this is a wild card and I'm, I'm happy to cut this if you don't want it in there, but um, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on NCAA athletes being compensated? There's a Supreme court ruling that's going to be heard next. Oh time. yeah. And they had like a bill on that in California, right? They, yeah, they did. They, they passed one. Um, we wrote about it last year, but um, it's going to go up. to. Yeah. So I day. personally am a big fan of that. I think it just comes down to profiting off of your own labor. There's no reason that yep. um, someone should be able to tell you that you can't earn anything off of your wages. Some people will say that, or off of your, your work. I mean, um, some people will say that it takes away the integrity of the college sport, which should just be paid for the love of it. But anyone that's saying that, maybe they have never played a college sport or maybe um, they are just trying to uh, pretend that they, uh, maybe they're one of the few people that has insane, this insane passion that they had when they were 14 and 15 and playing. Sure. But most college athletes, it's a complete grind. It's incredibly difficult. You are an athlete first and a student second. You cannot have a second job. You cannot yep. um, make money throughout college. You know, a lot of college athletes are actually really poor. I mean, with the exception of maybe football players, but that's the hardest sport you could play uh, sure. in a lot of ways. Um, and it makes the most money for a school, right? So um, there's that too. Um, but yeah, I am totally in favor of that. I wish I could have made money off of my career in college, just like a professional athlete, because you're actually treated like a professional athlete. So the NCAA yep. either needs to actually enforce their restrictions and allow them to be students first and athletes second, or let them profit off of the 80 hour weeks that they're putting in, you know, so. No, that is um, 100% not the correct answer, but um, <laughs> I, I think many, you know, PRI, I've written about it and done some interviews and um, we feel the same from just a free market perspective. I mean, these yeah. schools, um, I went to University of Oregon, you know, huge Nike school, um, huge football school, just the, um, the amount of money that comes in, basically, you know, football, basketball, but um, you forget most athletes don't go professional. And most, you know, you think of, I think of these small college towns where would they have the volleyball team and like a car dealership commercial or would, you know, would you, would a local business want you to go sign autograph? You know, there are all these little examples that you think of aside from, yes, Nike will give a contract to the top quarterbacks. So that's, that's always going to happen. Um, but there's so many other smaller, like micro examples that of athletes that, you know, they're never going to go pro, but in, in that community, they play an important role and they're probably an icon. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great, great example. Um, especially people in small towns and things could benefit from it. And just, sure. I mean, think about all the student athletes, even that just like send money back home to their families. Yeah. It, it, it really helps people. And it, it's like you said, it's your, it's your life's work at that time. Why shouldn't you be able to make money off of it? So I agree. No, that's, that's a great point. Um, well, what we're kind of winding down here. What, what's one piece of advice you'd give if someone's, um, you know, maybe coming out of high school, going into college, they're not sure they maybe want to go do think tank or public policy or government. What, what advice would you give them? Um, well, the first piece of advice I'd give them is just to be open. You never really know where your career is going to go. Um, and so you need to be open to a lot of different positions. If you want to go work at a think tank, be open to working in donor relations or communications or outreach or policy. Don't just be, have your heart set on one thing. You know, I first, my first job was in communications and then I switched over to policy and I did not expect that, but it's been a far better fit for me. Um, but you just have to be adaptable and ready to try different things. And then also getting your first job, I think can be really intimidating, but you just need to remember, you know, they, these people that are hiring you, they know what they're getting with a fresh college graduate. You're going into an entry level position. Likely you just need to have sure. confidence, show that you're an amicable person. Um, in that you can, you know, work well with other people. Um, and then also, you know, obviously if you're going into the liberty movement, you need to know what you believe, or if you're going to work for any kind of thing, think whatever side of the aisle you're on, you need to know what you believe. You need to have strong principles um, and be ready not to compromise them and be ready to be attacked for them. And so you need to have um, to some level a thick skin to be able to stand up to, to scrutiny. No, that's, um, uh, that's great advice, especially having thick skin. Um, I, I think people, early on in their career, maybe get a bad taste or have a bad experience through something. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's, that's A, life and B, working and it happens and you, you have, just have to learn how to move on and roll with the punches, so to speak. 
Definitely. Well, um, last question, and this is a fun one. I, I brought it back. It, I, w I took it away because, you know, I thought COVID was, was over in the fall um, and it's back, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, what is a, maybe a project or a hobby you picked up maybe during the shutdowns or now that some of the shutdowns are coming back around? Um, yeah. What, what's one that you found? Yeah, so this isn't directly re related to like the existence of COVID, but it's a project I've worked sure. on during the shutdowns and things. Um, it's actually coming out on Monday. I'll show you a copy. Um, it's called Social Justice in Idaho Higher Education. Nice. And it's examining just how deep social justice ideology has gone into our universities. So a lot of people have written about this in um, all sorts of instances all across the country, but no one has really looked at a particular university and evaluated um, a way that can be measured just how deep this ideology has gone into um, higher education. And so that's what we've attempted to do with this project. And we're doing every public university in Idaho. And we have, you know, like recommendations for the legislature to fix this problem. So it's a very practical publication. And we actually are hoping to use this to get other states involved, other state think tanks um, to produce something like this in their state to evaluate all their public universities to find out how much this ideology has taken over um, universities in their states. Mm -hmm. and then to do something about it. Um, so yeah, it's an exciting project. Um, it's, um, it's something that I think is, is very needed and shows just, you know, it's amazing how much social justice ideology has taken over colleges, even in a red state like Idaho, um, that right. you would consider to be very conservative. Um, it's com completely taken over these schools. And when, once social justice ideology starts in a school, there's no limit to its growth um, it, it could grow as big as Ohio State University that has 100 diversity and inclusion officers and that school is still growing. There's just, there's no limit to it um, and it's wasting taxpayer dollars. It's teaching something that's false. It's leading away from the pursuit of truth. This is what universities should be after. Um, sure. And so, yeah, it's a cool publication we're working on that we're gonna, it's gonna come out on Monday. So I hope people Great. will take a minute to read it. Yeah, I mean, we're... Um... And I'll end with this. Where can folks find your work or, or your new studies? Where should they go? Um, so the main place you can go right now is just the Idaho Freedom Foundation website. Okay. Um, I also share a lot of my work um, on Twitter. I write op-eds and different um, articles and things like that in magazines regularly. And so if you follow me on Twitter at, um, I believe my Twitter handle is Anakate underscore Miller, um, okay. you'll be able to you know, keep up with my work. Um, and then the other places, you know, add me on LinkedIn. I'm always looking for new connections um, and to learn from other people. Great. All right. Well, Anna, thank you. Great conversation um, and learning about education work and, and your background. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me.